2. The Life of Greece, Part 2, by Will Durant. Continued, Cassette 2, Side 2. After the Iliad and the Odyssey, the Oresteia is the highest achievement in Greek literature. Here is breadth of conception, a unity of thought and execution, a power of dramatic development, an understanding of character, and a splendor of style, which in their sum we shall not find again before Shakespeare. The trilogy is as closely knit as the three acts of a well-designed drama. Each part foreshadows and requires the next with logical inevitability. As play succeeds play, the terror of the theme grows until we begin dimly to realize how deeply this story must have moved the Greeks. It is true that there is too much talk, even for four murders, that the lyrics are often obscure, their metaphors exaggerated, their language sometimes heavy and rough and strained. Nevertheless, these chorals are supreme in their kind, full of grandeur and tenderness, eloquent with their plea for a new religion of forgiveness and for the virtues of a political order that was passing away. For the Oresteia is as conservative as the Prometheus is radical, though only two years seem to have separated them in time. In 462, Ephialtes deprived the Areopagus of its powers. In 461, he was assassinated. In 458, Aeschylus offered in the Oresteia a defense of the Council of the Areopagus as the wisest body in the Athenian government. The poet was now full of years and could understand the old more easily than the young. Like Aristophanes, he longed for the virtues of the men of Marathon. Athenaeus would have us believe that Aeschylus was a great drinker, but in the Oresteia he is a Puritan preaching a sermon in buskins on sin and its punishment and the wisdom born of suffering. The law of hubris and nemesis is another doctrine of karma or of original sin. Every evil deed will be found out and be avenged in one life or another. In this way Greek thought made its trial at reconciling evil with God. All suffering is due to sin, even if it is the sin of a generation that is dead. The author of Prometheus was no naive pietist. His plays, even in the Oresteia, are studded with heresies. He was attacked for revealing ritual secrets and was saved only by the intercession of his brother, Aminius, who bared before the assembly the wounds he had received at Salamis. But Aeschylus was convinced that morality, to hold its own against unsocial impulse, required supernatural sanctions. He hoped that, One there is who heareth on high, some Pan or Zeus, some seer Apollo, and sendeth down for the law transgressed the wrath of the feet that follow. That is, the furies of conscience and retribution. Therefore he speaks with a solemn reverence of religion, and makes an effort to reach beyond polytheism to the conception of one God. Zeus, Zeus, whate'er he be, if this name he loved to hear, this he shall be called of me. Searching earth and sea and air, refuge nowhere can I find, save him only if my mind will cast off before it die the burden of this vanity. He identifies Zeus with the personified nature of things, the law or reason of the world. The law that is fate and the Father and all comprehending are here met together as one. Perhaps these concluding lines of his masterpiece were his last words as a poet. Two years after the Oresteia, we find him again in Sicily. Some believe that the audience, being more radical than the judges, did not like the trilogy, but this hardly accords with the fact that the Athenians, a few years later, and directly contrary to custom, decreed that his plays might be repeated in the theater of Dionysus, and that a chorus should be granted to anyone who offered to produce them. Many did, and Aeschylus continued to win prizes after his death. Meanwhile in Sicily, says an old story, an eagle had killed him by dropping a tortoise upon his bald head, mistaking it for a stone. There he was buried over his own epitaph, so strangely silent about his plays, so humanly proud of his scars. Beneath this stone lies Aeschylus, of his noble prowess the grove of Marathon can speak, or the long-haired Persian who knows it well. 4. Sophocles The first prize for tragedy was won from Aeschylus in 468 by a newcomer, aged 27, and bearing a name that meant the wise and honored one. Sophocles was the most fortunate of men, and almost the darkest of pessimists. He came from Colonus, a suburb of Athens, and was the son of a sword manufacturer, so that the Persian and Peloponnesian wars, which impoverished nearly all Athenians, left the dramatist a comfortable income. In addition to wealth, he had genius, beauty, and good health. He won the double prize for wrestling and music, a combination that would have pleased Plato. His skill as a ball player and a harpist enabled him to give public performances in both fields, 
and after the battle of Salamis it was he who was chosen by the city to lead the nude youths of Athens in a dance and song of victory. Even in later years he was handsome. The Lateran Museum statue shows him old and bearded and rounded, but still vigorous and tall. He grew up in the happiest age of Athens. He was the friend of Pericles and held high offices under him. In 443 he was imperial treasurer. In 440 he was one of the generals who commanded the Athenian forces in Pericles' expedition against Samos, though it should be added that Pericles preferred his poetry to his strategy. After the Athenian debacle in Syracuse, he was appointed to the Committee of Public Safety, and in this capacity he voted for the oligarchical constitution of 411. His character pleased the people more than his politics. He was genial, witty, unassuming, pleasure-loving, and endowed with a charm that atoned for all his errors. He had a fancy for money and boys, but in his old age he turned his favor to courtesans. He was very pious and occasionally filled the office of priest. He wrote 113 plays. We have only seven and do not know the order in which they were produced. Eighteen times he won the first award at the Dionysian, twice at the Linnean festivals. He received his first prize at twenty-five, his last at eighty-five. For thirty years he ruled the Athenian stage more completely than Pericles contemporaneously ruled Athens. He increased the number of actors to three and played a role himself until he lost his voice. He, and after him Euripides, abandoned the Aeschylean form of trilogy, preferring to compete with three independent plays. Aeschylus was interested in cosmic themes that overshadowed the persons of his drama. Sophocles was interested in character and was almost modern in his flair for psychology. The Trachinian Women is on its surface a sensational melodrama. Dianyra, jealous of her husband and Heracles' love for Iola, sends him unwittingly a poisoned robe, and when it consumes him, kills herself. What draws Sophocles here is not the punishment of Heracles, which would have seemed central to Aeschylus, nor even the passion of love, which would have attracted Euripides, but the psychology of jealousy. So in the Ajax no attention is paid to the mighty deeds of the hero. What lures the author is the study of a man going mad. In the Philoctetes there is almost no action but a frank analysis of injured simplicity and diplomatic dishonesty. In the Electra, the story is as slight as it is old. Aeschylus was fascinated by the moral issues involved. Sophocles almost ignores them in his eagerness to study with psychoanalytic ruthlessness the young woman's hatred of her mother. The play has given its name to a neurosis once widely discussed, as Oedipus the King has provided a name for another. Oedipus Tyrannus is the most famous of Greek dramas. Its opening scene is impressive. A motley throng of men, women, boys, girls, and infants sit before the royal palace in Thebes, carrying boughs of laurel and olive as symbols of supplication. A plague has fallen upon the city, and the people have gathered to beg King Oedipus to offer some appeasing sacrifice to the gods. An oracle announces that the plague will leave Thebes with the unknown assassin of Laius, the former king. Oedipus lays a bitter curse upon the murderer, whoever he may be, whose crime has brought such misery to Thebes. This is a perfect instance of that method which Horace advised, of plunging in medius race and letting explanations enter afterward. But the audience, of course, knew the story, for the tale of Laius, Oedipus, and the Sphinx was part of the folklore of the Greeks. Tradition said that a curse had been laid upon Laius and his children because he had introduced an unnatural vice into Hellas. The consequences of this sin, ruining generation after generation, formed a typical theme for Greek tragedy. Laius and his queen, Jocasta, said an oracle, would have a son who would slay his father and marry his mother. For once in the world's history two parents wanted a girl for their first child, but a son came, and to avoid fulfillment of the oracle he was exposed on the hills. A shepherd found him, called him Oedipus from his swollen feet, and gave him to the king and queen of Corinth, who reared him as their son. Grown to manhood, Oedipus learned again from the oracle that he was destined to kill his father and marry his mother. Believing the king and queen of Corinth to be his parents, he fled from that city and took the road to Thebes. On the way he met an old man, quarreled with him, and slew him, not knowing that the old man was his father. Nearing Thebes he encountered the Sphinx, a creature with the face of a woman, the tail of a lion, and the wings of a bird. To Oedipus the Sphinx presented its renowned riddle. What is that which is four-footed, three-footed, and two-footed? All who failed to answer correctly were destroyed by the Sphinx and the terrified Thebans, longing to clear the highway of this monster, had vowed to have as their next king whoever should solve the riddle, for the Sphinx had agreed to commit suicide if anyone answered it. Oedipus replied, Man, for as a child he crawls on four feet, as an adult he walks on two, and as an old man he adds a cane. 
It was a lame answer, but the Sphinx accepted it and loyally plunged to its death. The Thebans hailed Oedipus as their savior, and when Laius failed to return, they made the newcomer king. Obeying the custom of the land, Oedipus married the queen and had by her four children, Antigone, Polynices, Eteocles, and Ismene. In the second scene in Sophocles' play, the most powerful scene in Greek drama, an old high priest, commanded by Oedipus to reveal, if he can, the identity of Laius's murderer, names Oedipus himself. Nothing could be more tragic than the king's reluctant and terrified realization that he is the slayer of his father and the mate of his mother. Jocasta refuses to believe it and explains it away as a Freudian dream. It has been the lot of many men in dreams, she reassures Oedipus, to think themselves partners of their mother's bed, but he passes through life most easily to whom these things become trifles. When the identification is complete, she hangs herself, and Oedipus, mad with remorse, gouges out his own eyes and leaves Thebes as an exile with only Antigone to help him. In Oedipus at Colonus, the second play of an unintentional trilogy, Oedipus the King, Oedipus at Colonus, and Antigone were produced separately, the former king is a white-haired outcast leaning upon his daughter's arm and begging his bread from town to town. He comes in his wandering to shady Colonus, and Sophocles takes the opportunity to sing to his native village and its faithful olive groves, an untranslatable song which ranks high in Greek poetry. Stranger, where thy feet now rest in this land of horse and rider, here is earth all earth excelling. White Colonus here doth shine, oftenest here and homing best where the close green coverts hide her, warbling her sweet mournful tale, sings the melodious nightingale. Fresh with heavenly dews and crowned with earliest white in shining cluster, each new morn the young Narcissus blooms. And a marvelous herb of the soil grows here, whose match I never heard it sung in the Dorian Isle of Pelops near, or in Asia far hath sprung. Tis a plant that flourishes unsubdued, self-engendering, self-renewed, to her armed foe's dismay, that never so fair but in this land bloomed with the gray-blue silvery leaf soft-plumed her nurturing olive spray. No force, no ravaging hand shall raise it, in youth so rash or in age so wise, for the orb of Zeus in heaven surveys it, and blue-gray light of Athena's eyes. An oracle has foretold that Oedipus will die in the precincts of the Eumenides, and when he learns that he is now in their sacred grove at Colonus, the old man, having found no loveliness in life, thinks that here it would be sweet to die. To Theseus, king of Athens, he speaks lines that sum up with clairvoyant insight the forces that were weakening Greece, the decay of the soil, of faith, of morals, and of men. Only to gods in heaven comes no old age, nor death of anything. All else is turmoiled by our master time. The earth's strength fades, and manhood's glory fades. Faith dies, and unfaith blossoms like a flower. And who shall find in the open streets of men or secret places of his own heart's love one wind blow true forever. Then, seeming to hear the call of a god, Oedipus bids a tender farewell to Antigone and Ismene and walks into the dark grove, Theseus alone accompanying him. Going on a little space we turned, and lo, we saw the man no more, but he, the king, Theseus, was there, holding a hand to shade his eyes as one to whom there comes a vision drear and dread he may not bear to look upon. What form of death he died knows no man but our Theseus only but either some one whom the gods had sent to guide his steps, or else the abyss of earth in friendly mood had opened wide its jaws without one pang. And so the man was led with naught to mourn for, did not leave the world as worn with pain and sickness, but his end, if any ever was, was wonderful. The last play in the sequence, but apparently the first of the three to be composed, carries the faithful Antigone to her grave. Hearing that her brothers Polynices and Eteocles are warring for the kingdom, she hurries back to Thebes in the hope of bringing peace but she is ignored, and the brothers fight to their death. Creon, ally of Eteocles, seizes the throne and, as punishment for Polynices' rebellion, forbids his burial. Antigone, sharing the Greek belief that the spirit of the dead is tortured so long as the corpse is not interred, violates the edict and buries Polynices. Meanwhile, the chorus sings one of the most renowned of Sophocles' odes. Many wonders there be, but not more wondrous than man. Over the surging sea with a whitening south wind wan, through the foam of the firth man makes his perilous way. And the eldest of deities, earth, that knows not toil or decay, ever he furrows and scores, as his team year in and year out, with breed of the yoked horse the plowshare turneth about. 
The light-witted birds of the air, the beasts of the wild and the wood, he traps with his woven snare, and the brood of the briny flood. Master of cunning he, the savage bull and the heart who roams the mountain free are tamed by his infinite art, and the shaggy rough-maned steed is broken to bear the bit. Speech and the wind-swift speed of counsel and civic wit, he hath learned for himself all these, and with the arrowy rain to fly and the nipping airs that freeze neath the open winter sky, he hath provision for all. Fell plague he hath learned to endure, safe whate'er may befall, yet for death he hath found no cure. Antigone is condemned by Creon to be buried alive. Creon's son Hymen protests against the awful sentence, and being repulsed swears to his father, Thou shalt never more set eyes upon my face. Here for a moment love plays a part in the Sophoclean tragedy, and the poet intones to Eros a hymn long remembered in antiquity. Love resistless in fight, all yield at a glance of thine eye. Love, who pillowed all night on a maiden's cheek, doth lie. Over the upland folds thou roamest, and the trackless sea. Love the gods captive holds, shall mortals not yield to thee? Hymen disappears, and in search for him Creon orders his soldiers to open the cave in which Antigone has been entombed. There they find Antigone dead, and beside her Hymen, resolved to die. We looked, and in the cavern's vaulted gloom I saw the maiden lying strangled there, a noose of linen twined about her neck, and hard beside her, clasping her cold form, her lover lay bewailing his dead bride. When the king saw him with a terrible groan, he moved towards him, crying, O my son, what hast thou done? What ailed thee? What mischance has reft thee of thy reason? O come forth, come forth, my son, thy father supplicates. But the son glared at him with tiger eyes, spat in his face, and then, without a word, drew his two-hilted sword and smote, but missed his father flying backwards. Then the boy, wroth with himself, poor wretch, incontinent, fell on his sword and drove it through his side home. But yet breathing, clasped in his lax arms the maid, her pallid cheek incarnadined with his expiring gasps. So there they lay, two corpses, one in death. The dominant qualities of these plays, surviving time and translation, are beauty of style and mastery of technique. Here is the typically classic form of utterance, polished, placid, and serene, vigorous but restrained, dignified but graceful, with the strength of Phidias and the smooth delicacy of Praxiteles. Classic, too, is the structure. Every line is relevant and moves towards that moment in which the action finds its climax and its significance. Each of these plays is built like a temple, wherein every part is carefully finished in detail, but has its proper and subordinate place in the whole, except that the Philoctetes lazily accepts the deus ex machina, which is a jest in Euripides, as a serious solution of a knotty plot. Here, as in Aeschylus, the drama moves upward towards the hubris of some crowning insolence, as in Oedipus's bitter curse upon the unknown murderer, turns around some anagnorisis or sudden recognition, some peripatia or reversal of fortune, and moves downward toward the nemesis of inevitable punishment. Aristotle, when he wished to illustrate perfection of dramatic structure, always referred to Oedipus the king, and the two plays that deal with Oedipus illustrate well the Aristotelian definition of tragedy as a purging of pity and terror through their objective presentation. The characters are more clearly drawn than in Aeschylus, though not as realistically as in Euripides. I draw men as they ought to be drawn, said Sophocles. Euripides draws them as they are as if to say that drama should admit some idealization and that art should not be photography. But the influence of Euripides appears in the argumentativeness of the dialogue and the occasional exploitation of sentiment. So Oedipus wrangles unroyally with Tiresias and, blinded, gropes about touchingly to feel the faces of his daughters. Aeschylus, contemplating the same situation, would have forgotten the daughters and thought of some eternal law. Sophocles, too, is a philosopher and a preacher, but his counsels rely less than those of Aeschylus upon the sanctions of the gods. The spirit of the sophists has touched him, and though he maintains a prosperous orthodoxy, he reveals himself as one who might have been Euripides had he not been so fortunate. But he has too much of the poet's sensitivity to excuse the suffering that comes so often undeserved to men. Says Lillis over Heracles's writhing body, we are blameless, but confess that the gods are pitiless. Children they beget and claim worship in a father's name, yet with apathetic eye look upon such agony. He makes Jocasta laugh at oracles, though his plays turn upon them creakingly. Creon denounces the prophets as all a money-getting tribe, 
and Philoctetes asks the old question, how justify the ways of heaven, finding heaven unjust? Sophocles answers hopefully that though the moral order of the world may be too subtle for us to understand it, it is there, and right will triumph in the end. Following Aeschylus, he identifies Zeus with this moral order and comes even more closely to monotheism. Like a good Victorian, he is uncertain of his theology, but strong in his moral faith. The highest wisdom is to find that law which is Zeus, the moral compass of the world, and follow it. O oh, may my constant feet not fail, walking in paths of righteousness, sinless in word and deed, true to those eternal laws that scale forever the high steep of heaven's pure ether whence they sprang. For only in Olympus is their home, nor mortal wisdom gave them birth, and howsoe'er men may forget, they will not sleep. It is the pen of Sophocles, but the voice of Aeschylus, faith making the last stand against unbelief. In this piety and resignation we see the figure of Job repentant and reconciled, but between the lines we catch premonitions of Euripides. Like Solon, Sophocles counts that man most blessed who has never been born, and him next happiest who dies in infancy. A modern pessimist has taken pleasure in translating the somber lines of the chorus on the death of Oedipus, lines that reflect a world weariness brought on by old age and the bitter fratricide of the Peloponnesian War. What man is he that yearneth for length unmeasured of days? Folly mine eye discerneth, encompassing all his ways. For years overrunning the measure shall change thee in evil wise. Grief draweth nigh thee, and pleasure, behold, it is hid from thine eyes. This to their wage have they which overlive their day. Thy portion esteem I highest, who wast not ever begot, thy next being born, who diest, and straightway again are not. With follies light as the feather doth youth to man befall. Then evils gather together, there wants not one of them all. Wrath, envy, discord, strife, the sword that seeketh life. And sealing the sum of trouble doth tottering age draw nigh, whom friends and kinsfolk fly age upon whom redouble all sorrows under the sky. And he that loseth from labor doth one with other befriend, whom bride nor bridesman attend, song nor sound of the tabor, death that maketh an end. Every scholastic gossip knows that Sophocles consoled his old age with the Hetaira Theorus, and had offspring by her, his legitimate son Iophon, fearing perhaps that the poet would bequeath his wealth to Theorus's child, brought his father to court on a charge of financial incompetence. Sophocles read to the jury as evidence of his mental clarity certain choruses from the play which he was writing, probably the Oedipus at Colonus, whereupon the judges not only acquitted him but escorted him to his home. Born many years before Euripides, he lived to put on mourning for him, and then in that same year 406 he too died. Legend tells how, as the Spartans besieged Athens, Dionysus, god of the drama, appeared to Lysander and obtained a safe conduct for the friends of Sophocles, who wished to bury him in the sepulchre of his fathers at Decalia. The Greeks rendered him divine honors, and the poet Simeus composed for him a quiet epitaph. Creep gently, Ivy, ever gently creep, where Sophocles sleeps on in calm repose. Thy pale green tresses o'er the marble sweep, while all around shall bloom the purple rose. There let the vine with rich full clusters hang, its fair young tendrils flung around the stone. Do mead for that sweet wisdom which he sang, by muses and by graces called their own. 5. Euripides 1. The Plays As Giotto rough-hewed the early path of Italian painting, and Raphael subdued the art with a quiet spirit into technical perfection, and Michelangelo completed the development in works of tortured genius, as Bach, with incredible energy, forced open a broad road to modern music, and Mozart perfected its form in melodious simplicity, and Beethoven completed the development in works of unbalanced grandeur. So Aeschylus cleared the way and set the forms for Greek drama with his harsh verse and stern philosophy. Sophocles fashioned the art with measured music and placid wisdom, and Euripides completed the development in works of passionate feeling and turbulent doubt. Aeschylus was a preacher of almost Hebraic intensity. Sophocles was a classic artist, clinging to a broken faith. Euripides was a romantic poet who could never write a perfect play because he was distracted by philosophy. They were the Isaiah, Job, and Ecclesiastes of Greece. 
Euripides was born in the year, some say on the day of Salamis, probably on the island itself, to which we are told his parents had fled for refuge from the invading Medes. His father was a man of some property and prominence in the Attic town of Phyla. His mother was of noble family, though the hostile Aristophanes insists that she kept a grocer's shop and hawked fruit and flowers on the street. In later life he lived on Salamis, loving the solitude of its hills and its varied prospects of blue sea. Plato wished to be a dramatist and became a philosopher. Euripides wished to be a philosopher and became a dramatist. He took the entire course of Anaxagoras, says Strabo. He studied for a while with Prodicus and was so intimate with Socrates that some suspected the philosopher of having a hand in the poet's plays. The whole sophistic movement entered into his education and through him captured the Dionysian stage. He became the Voltaire of the Greek Enlightenment, worshipping reason with destructive innuendo in the midst of dramas staged to celebrate a god. The records of the Dionysian theatre credit him with seventy-five plays, from the Daughters of Peleus in 455 to the Bacchae in 406. Eighteen survive, and a medley of fragments from the rest. Their subject matter tells again the legends of the early Greeks, but with a note of sceptical protest sounding timidly and then boldly between the lines. The Ion presents the reputed founder of the Ionian tribes in a delicate dilemma. The Oracle of Apollo declares Zeus to be his father, but Ion discovers that he is the son of Apollo, who seduced his mother and then palmed her off on Zeus. Can it be, Ion asks, that the noble god is a liar? In Heracles and Alcestis, the mighty son of Zeus and Alcmena is described as a good-natured drunkard with the appetite of Gargantua and the brains of Louis the Sixteenth. The Alcestis recounts the unprepossessing story of how the gods, as a condition of allowing further life to Admetus, king of Thessaly and Fury, required that some other should consent to die in his stead. His wife offers herself as a sacrifice and bids him a hundred-line farewell, which he hears with magnanimous patience. Alcestis is carried out for dead, but Heracles, between solitary drinking bouts and banquets, goes forth, argues and browbeats death into relinquishing Alcestis, and brings her back alive. The play can be understood only as a subtle attempt to make the legend ridiculous. It was presented in 438 as the fourth play in a group by Euripides. Perhaps it was intended as a half-serious satyr play rather than as a half-comic tragedy. In Philostian's adventure, Browning, with generous simplicity, has taken the play at its face value. The Hippolytus applies with more finesse and grace the same method of reduction to the absurd. The handsome hero is a youthful huntsman who vows to Artemis, virgin goddess of the chase, that he will always be faithful to her, will ever shun women, and will find his greatest pleasure in the woods. Aphrodite, incensed by this insulting celibacy, pours into the heart of Phaedra, Theseus' wife, a mad passion for Hippolytus, Theseus' son by the Amazon Antiope. Here is the first love tragedy in extant literature, and here at the outset are all the symptoms of love at the crisis of its fever. Phaedra, rejected by Hippolytus, languishes and fades to the point of death. Her nurse, suddenly become a philosopher, muses with Hamlet-like skepticism about a life beyond the grave. Yet all man's life is but ailing and dim, and rest upon the earth comes never. But if any far-off state there be, dearer than life to mortality, the hand of the dark hath hold thereof, and mist is under and mist above. And some are sick for life, and cling on earth to this nameless and shining thing. For other life is a fountain sealed, and the deeps below us are unrevealed, and we drift on legends forever. The nurse bears a message to Hippolytus that Phaedra's bed will welcome him. He, knowing that she is his father's wife, is horrified, and bursts into one of those passages that earned Euripides a reputation for misogyny. O God, why hast thou made this gleaming snare, woman, to dog us on the happy earth? Was it thy will to make man? Why his birth through love and woman? Phaedra dies, and in her hand her husband finds a note saying that Hippolytus seduced her. Theseus wildly calls upon Poseidon to slay Hippolytus. The youth protests his innocence, but is not believed. He is driven out of the land by Theseus, and as his chariot passes along the shore, a sea lion emerges from the waves and pursues him. His horses run away, upset the chariot, and drag the entangled Hippolytus, that is, torn by horses, over the rocks to a mangled death. And the chorus cries out in lines that must have startled Athens, Ye gods that did snare him, lo, I cast in your faces my hate and my scorn. 
In the Medea, Euripides forgets for a while his war against the gods and transforms the story of the Argonauts into his most powerful play. When Jason reaches Colchis, the royal princess Medea falls in love with him, helps him to get the golden fleece, and then, to shield him, deceives her father and kills her brother. Jason vows eternal love to her and takes her back with him to Iolcus. There, the most savage Medea poisons King Peleus to secure the throne that Peleus promised to Jason. Since the law of Thessaly forbids him to marry a foreigner, Jason lives with Medea in unwedded love and has two children by her. But in time he tires of her barbarian intensity, looks about him for a legal wife and heir, and proposes to marry the daughter of Creon, king of Corinth. Creon accepts him and exiles Medea. Medea, brooding upon her wrongs, speaks one of the famous passages of Euripides in defense of woman. Of all things upon earth that bleed and grow, an herb most bruised is woman. We must pay our store of gold hoarded for that one day to buy us some man's love, and lo, they bring a master of our flesh. There comes the sting of the whole shame. And then the jeopardy, for good or ill, what shall that master be? Home never taught her that, how best to guide toward peace the thing that sleepeth at her side. And she who laboring long shall find some way whereby her Lord may bear with her, nor fray his yoke too fiercely. Blessed is the breath that woman draws, else let her pray for death. Her Lord, if he be wearied of her face within doors, gets him forth. Some merrier place will ease his heart. But she waits on, her whole vision enchained on a single soul. And then they say, tis they that face the call of war, while we sit sheltered, hid from all peril. False mocking! Sooner would I stand three times to face their battles, shield in hand, than bear one child. Then follows the terrible story of her revenge. She sends to her rival in pretended reconciliation a set of costly robes. The Corinthian princess puts one on and is consumed in fire. Creon, trying to rescue her, is burned to death. Medea kills her own children and drives off with their dead bodies before Jason's eyes. The chorus chants a philosophic end. Great treasure halls hath Zeus in heaven, from whence to man strange dooms be given, past hope or fear. And the end men look for cometh not, and a path is there where no man thought, so hath it fallen here. The remaining plays turn for the most part upon the tale of Troy. In Helen we get the revised version of Stesichorus and Herodotus. The Spartan queen does not elope with Paris to Troy. She is carried against her will to Egypt and chastely awaits her master there. All Greece, Euripides suggests, has been hoodwinked by the legend of Helen in Troy. In Iphigenia in Aulis he pours into the old story of Agamemnon's sacrifice a profusion of sentiment new to the Greek drama and a Lucretian horror of the crimes to which the ancient faith persuaded men. Aeschylus and Sophocles had also written on this theme, but their plays were soon forgotten in the brilliance of this new performance. The arrival of Clytemnestra and her daughter is visioned with Euripidean tenderness. Orestes, yet a wordless babe, is present to witness the superstitious murder that will dictate his destiny. The girl is all shyness and happiness as she runs to greet the king. Fain am I, father, on thy breast to fall after so long. Though others I outrun, for, oh, I yearn for thy face, be not wroth. So glad to see me, yet what troubled look. Agamemnon, on kings and captains weigheth many a care. Iphigenia, this hour be mine, this one yield not to care. Agamemnon, yea, I am all thine now, my thoughts stray not. Iphigenia, and yet, and yet, thine eyes are welling tears. Agamemnon, yea, for the absence yet to come is long. Iphigenia, I know not, know not, dear my sire, thy meaning. Agamemnon, thy wise discernment stirs my grief the more. Iphigenia, so I may please thee, folly will I talk. When Achilles comes, she finds that he knows nothing of their supposed marriage. Instead, she learns that the army is impatient for her sacrifice. She throws herself at Agamemnon's feet and begs for her life. I was thy firstborn, first I called thee sire, and sat thy child upon thy knees the first, and we exchanged sweet charities of life. And this was thy discourse with me, My child, shall I behold thee happy in the home of thy liege lord and husband as befits? And nestling in the beard which now I clasp a suppliant, I made answer unto thee, I too will welcome thee when grey with years in the sweet shelter of my home, my sire, and with fond fostering recompense thy love. Such were our words which I remember well, but thou forgettest and wouldst take my life. 
Clytemnestra denounces Agamemnon's surrender to a savage ritual and utters a threat that contains many tragedies. Constrain me not to turn traitress to thee. She encourages Achilles' attempt to rescue the girl, but Iphigenia, changing her mood, refuses to escape. Hear the thing that flashed upon me, mother, as I thought hereon. Lo, I am resolved to die, and fain am I that this be done gloriously, that I thrust ignoble thoughts away. Unto me almighty Hellas looks. I only can bestow boons upon her, sailing of her galleys, Phrygia's overthrow, safety for her daughters from barbarians in the days to come, that the ravisher no more may snatch them from a happy home. When the penalty is paid for Paris's outrage, Helen's shame, all this great deliverance I in death shall compass, and my name, as of one who gave to Hellas freedom, shall be blessing crowned. When the soldiers come for her, she forbids them to touch her, and moves of her own accord to the sacrificial pyre. In the Hecuba, the war is over, Troy has been taken, and the victors are apportioning the spoils. Hecuba, widow of King Priam, sends her youngest son Polydorus with a treasure of gold to Priam's friend, Polymnestor, king of Thrace. But Polymnestor, thirsting for the gold, slays the boy and throws his corpse into the sea. It is cast up on the shores of Ilion and is brought to Hecuba. Meanwhile, the shade of dead Achilles holds the winds from blowing the Greek fleet homeward till he has received in human sacrifice the fairest of Priam's daughters, Polyxena. The Greek herald, Talthybius, comes to take the girl from Hecuba. Finding her prostrate, disheveled, and distraught, who had so recently been a queen, he utters some lines of Euripidean doubt. What shall I say, Zeus, that thou look'st on men, or that this fancy false we vainly hold for naught, who deem there is a race of gods, while chance controlleth all things among men? The next act of the composite drama takes the form of the Trojan women. It was produced in 415, shortly after the Athenian destruction of Milos in 416, and almost on the eve of the expedition that aimed to conquer Sicily for the Athenian Empire. It was at this moment that Euripides, shocked by the massacre in Milos and by the brutal imperialism of the proposed attack upon Syracuse, dared to present a powerful plea for peace, a brave portrayal of victory from the standpoint of the defeated, the greatest denunciation of war in ancient literature. He begins where Homer ends, after the capture of Troy. The Trojans lie dead after a general slaughter, and their women, bereaved to madness, pass down from their ruined city to be the concubines of the victors. Hecuba enters with her daughters Andromache and Cassandra. Polyxena has already been sacrificed, and now Talthybius comes to lead Cassandra to Agamemnon's tent. Hecuba falls to the ground in grief. Andromache tries to console her, but she too breaks down, as clasping the little prince Astyanax to her breast, she thinks of his dead father. Andromache. And I, long since I drew my bow straight at the heart of good fame, and I know my shaft hit, for that I am the more fallen from peace. All that men praise us for, I loved for Hector's sake, and sought to win. I knew that always, be there hurt therein, or utter innocence, to roam abroad hath ill report for women. So I trod down the desire thereof, and walked my way in mine own garden. And light words and gay parley of women never passed my door. The thoughts of mine own heart, I craved no more, spake with me, and I was happy. Constantly I brought fair silence and a tranquil eye for Hector's greeting, and watched well the way of living, where to guide and where obey. One night, I, men have said it, maketh tame a woman in a man's arms. Oh, shame, shame! What woman's lips can so forswear her dead and give strange kisses in another's bed? Why, not a dumb beast, not a colt will run in the yoke untroubled when her mate is gone? O oh, my Hector, best beloved that, being mine, wast all in all to me, my prince, my wise one, O oh, my majesty of valiance! No man's touch had ever come near me when thou from out my father's home didst lead me and make me thine. And thou art dead, and I war flung to slavery and the bread of shame in Hellas over bitter seas. Hecuba, dreaming of some distant revenge, bids Andromache accept her new master graciously, that he may allow her to rear Astyanax, and that Astyanax may some day restore the house of Priam and the splendor of Troy. But the Greeks have thought of this too, and Talthybius comes to announce that Astyanax must die. Tis their will thy son from this crested wall of Troy be dashed to death. He tears the child from its mother's arms, and Andromache, holding it for a last moment, bids it an hysterical farewell. Go, die, my best beloved, my cherished one, in fierce men's hands, leaving me here alone. Thy father was too valiant, that is why they slay thee. 
and none to pity thee. Thou little thing that curlest in my arms, what sweet scents cling all round thy neck. Beloved, can it be all nothing that this bosom cradled thee and fostered all the weary nights wherethrough I watched upon thy sickness till I grew wasted with watching? Kiss me, this one time, not ever again. Put up thine arms and climb about my neck. Now kiss me lips to lips. Oh, ye have found an anguish that outstrips all tortures of the east, ye gentle Greeks. Quick, take him, drag him, cast him from the wall, if cast ye will. Tear him, ye beasts, be swift. God hath undone me, and I cannot lift one hand, one hand, to save my child from death. She becomes delirious and swoons. Soldiers carry her away. Menelaus appears and bids his soldiers bring Helen to him. He has sworn that he will kill her, and Hecuba is comforted at the thought that punishment is at last to find Helen. I bless thee, Menelaus, I bless thee if thou wilt slay her. Only fear to see her visage, lest she snare thee and thou fall. Helen enters untouched and unafraid, proud in the consciousness of her beauty. Hecuba. And comest thou now forth, and hast decked thy bosom and thy brow, and breathest with thy lord the same blue air, thou evil heart? Lo, lo, with ravaged hair, rent raiment, and flesh shuddering, and within, O oh, shame at last, not glory for thy sin. Be true, O king, let Hellas bear the crown of justice, slay this woman. Menelaus, peace, aged woman, peace, to the soldiers. Have some chambered galley set for her, where she may sail the seas. Hecuba, a lover once will always love again. As Helen and Menelaus leave, Talthybius returns, bearing the dead body of Astyanax. Talthybius, Andromache hath charmed these tears into mine eyes, weeping her fatherland as o'er the wave. She gazed, speaking words to Hector's grave. Howbeit she prayed us that due rites be done for burial of this babe, and in thine hands she bade me lay him to be swathed in bands of death and garments. Hecuba takes the body. Hecuba, ah, what a death hath found thee, little one! Ye tender arms, the same dear mould have ye as his. And dear proud lips, so full of hope, and closed for ever. What false words ye said at daybreak when ye crept into my bed, called me kind names, and promised, Grandmother, when thou art dead, I will cut close my hair, and lead out all the captains to ride by thy tomb. Why didst thou cheat me so? Tis I, old, homeless, childless, that for thee must shed cold tears, so young, so miserably dead. Dear God, the pattering welcomes of thy feet, the nursing in my lap, and, oh, the sweet falling asleep together, all is gone. How should a poet carve the funeral stone to tell thy story true? There lieth here a babe whom the Greeks feared, and in their fear slew him. Ay, Greece will bless the tale it tells. O oh, vain is man, who glorieth in his joy, and hath no fears, while to and fro the chances of the years dance like an idiot in the wind. She wraps the child in burial garments. Glory of Phrygian raiment, which my thought kept for thy bridal day with some far-sought queen of the east, folds thee forevermore. In the Electra, the ancient theme is far advanced. This book is continued on cassette three, side one.